in this area. So she's a professor at the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Washington. And she spent more than 20 years looking at the health risks of climate variability and climate change. Um, and focusing on the impacts and adaptation to climate, um, to climate variability and change, including on extreme events, thermal stress, foodborne safety and security, and vector-borne diseases. And I, I watched her talk last year at the SAMSI workshop um, that started the year of climate at SAMSI, and I was just blown away. I mean, sometimes you start to really interact with your own universe only, and you talk to climate scientists, and you think this is how, this is basically the end all is coming up with this kind of representation of temperature changes. And then you see a presentation like this, and you think, yeah, but at the end, that's not what matters. What matters at the end is the impact on people. And so, you know, she's really closing the feedback loop in terms of, okay, these are the impacts on people. And I think we also have to realize there should be a feedback loop also coming back where we learn, okay, what kind of information do you actually need in order to make these kind of statements? But I will just stop here and say I'm very excited. And Christy, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you all for joining this. I look forward to interacting with you over the next half hour or so. And yes, I'm happy to stay after. And I wanna start with, I don't know what all your backgrounds are. So I do have some background slides on climate change to make a couple of points. I'll try to keep those limited, but if people really don't need to see them, then that's fine too. I can always skip those. Christy, for some reason, we can only see half of your screen. At least I can only see half of your screen. Well, I don't know what the deal is. What do you see? I see the left. I said share. Yes, the left yeah. side is, is white, and the right side shows the left side of your slides. The left half. That was very weird, because I did share my screen. What I hope you use the slide. Does that make a are. difference? Yes, that's it. Perfect. So it's Thank not, you. for the future, it's not share your screen, screen. It's something about the slideshow. Okay. Thank you. Take it away. All right. So we're talking about the future. And when we talk about the future, we talk about risk. Because the future is inherently, inherently uncertain. And risk is the probability of adverse consequences. It's probability times consequence. And in the framing of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, as you can see on the slide, that risk is formed of three main factors. One is the hazards created by changing climate. The other two factors are exposure. Who or what is exposed to that hazard? For example, the same strength typhoon is it Japan and the Philippines, not the same typhoon, the same strength typhoon. But the exposures are very different. There's different coastal hardening, there's different infrastructure, there's lots of reasons why the exposure differed from place to place. And then the third factor is vulnerability. How vulnerable are the human and natural systems where you have that exposure? Impacts arise out of risk. So we're, we're talking about what could be. And then adaptation, mitigation options then intervene between the risk and the impact. So we've got short-term and long-term ways to try and reduce future risk. And you can see on this that natural climate variability and anthropogenic climate change feed into the hazards and a whole range of socioeconomic processes feed into the exposure and the vulnerability. And I'm gonna talk briefly about each of these factors, the, the hazard, the exposure, and the vulnerability. I assume you have seen slides like this. I actually took this out of a, a little video clip. So this shows the temperatures in 1880 to 1884 relative to 1961 to 90. And on my screen, I see the list of all the people on the call, but I don't see the, oh, there we go. So now I see the corner of my slide, and so you can see the scale. And as you would expect, just after the start of the Industrial Revolution, that the world, by and large, was much cooler than it was in 1961 to 90. 
I hate to jump this, in again, but I still see your first slide. Well, I see the second slide. Do you see it? Do you see it now? I still see What's it. What's going on with this? Yeah, it's strange. Um, let's let's try the sharing again. Let's uh, maybe unshare and reshare and. Uh, Here we go. I think. All right, now you've got, what do you have besides the slide? I've got all the participants, I've got my Zoom account, I've got all kinds of random stuff all over my screen. Do you I, see the second, do you see the slide now? I see the second slide, and then I see all of the participants above the top of the screen, the ribbon, and that's it. Well, well good. Well, we're just going to go with this work. Okay. Yes. So let me know if it doesn't. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Technology is great fun, isn't it? So this is 100 years after the last slide, same scale, 10 years after the previous slide, and 10 years after the one just before. And this makes points that are important for health, they're important for other systems as well. One is the rate of climate change. The rate of climate change right now is faster than it's been in more than 10,000 years. And that is increasingly important, as we're seeing around the world. The second is the uneven heating, the uneven change. You can see, of course, that the Arctic is warming faster than most parts of the world, but also that parts of Brazil and parts of Africa are warming almost as much as the Arctic. And that unevenness is really important when we think about the health risks. Health is primarily a top-down kind of sector. There's a problem with lead in paint or lead in gasoline. There's a problem with cigarette smoking. The sector goes out and does exposure response relationships, works out an exposure response relationship, relationship and applies it everywhere. That doesn't work with climate change because our exposures are different in different locations. And of course, it's not just the change in the mean temperatures, it's also changes in the extreme. Nice little cartoon from Climate Central on the left. In fact, that cartoon is misleading because what is being seen is not just the shift in the average, but in fact, the curve is being flattened and moved out to the right. So you're seeing a, a much more extreme on the right than you would if you just saw a change in the average. The figure is from work Noah Diffenbaugh and others did for the IPCC special report on managing the risks of extreme events. Now I've got installed. Hang on. I mean, honestly, this is really fascinating. So on the right, I can now see <laughs> the work from Noah Diffenbaugh where the scientists took the world, broke it into 26 world regions, and then for June, July, and August, or the opposite in the Southern Hemisphere, over the period 1985 to 2005, asked what was the one hottest day. And then using that information for the three time slices you see, asked from their models of how often would that temperature occur under moderate emissions, RCP 4.5, and high emissions, RCP 8.5. Right now, we're more or less following RCP 8.5, and you can see right now that parts of the tropics are starting to see those temperatures every year on average. And you can also see if we continue under high emissions, we end up in a world where the coolest day in the summer will be hotter than the hottest day today. Our summers will be completely different. And when you think about all the outdoor activities, everything from baseball games to people who work outside, to those of us who like to go outside and enjoy the weather, you're going to see very different patterns going forward. All right, now my screen doesn't want to let me move forward with my slides. How I've never had this much trouble. Um, I can't actually move. Oh, there we go. Okay. 
it's not just warmer temperatures, warmer air holds more water. So the figure from Climate Central shows you as temperature goes up, you see a big increase in the amount of water vapor that the air can hold. That water vapor has to come out somewhere. And I've got a picture and a map from China from 2016, just giving an indication of so many places in the world are seeing extensive flooding. There's also the converse that when it's not raining with warmer air temperatures, the higher temperatures remove soil moisture. So they, they, there's more evapotranspiration. So you see more drought and more floods. So again, much more extremes. This is some recent work from Sonia Senovaratne looking at the maximum daytime temperature with a 25% chance of occurring at warming of 1.5 degrees C. The world's already warmed one degree, and under many climate models, we will reach 1.5 as a global mean surface temperature, either in the 2030s or the 2040s. So not very far from now. And on the left, you can see the bottom quartile. On the right, you can see the upper quartile. And again, this is the quartile within the quartile showing that these are the range of possible temperatures that could occur with warming of 1.5. Obviously, an enormous range changes in some places, like where I live in Seattle, of maybe even a slight cooling to a very significant warming, even at 1.5. And obviously, at 2, it gets a lot worse. So as the title of my, my talk mentioned, we're moving into perhaps unrecognizable worlds, worlds that are very different from our own. The second factor I want to talk about is vulnerability. This is one of my favorite slides. This is apparently a data-driven slide from the Doghouse Diaries. They got all kinds of data and determine what each country leads the world in. The U.S. leads the world in Nobel laureates and being killed by lawnmowers. Brazil leads the world in FIFA World Cup title. It's quite entertaining, and it makes the really important point that every place has different capacities, and they have different vulnerabilities. And so when we think about risks under a future climate, we have to take that into account. It's not just the temperature precipitation change, but where it's occurring, and, and what's the status of those human and natural systems in those places? In thinking about what the future could look like, on the left, there was a process that completed recently developing shared socioeconomic pathways. These are paired with representative concentra concentration pathways to develop scenarios of the future. You can see there's five. Worlds with low challenges to adaptation and mitigation are aiming to sustainable development. High challenges to adaptation and mitigation is a world with very high regional rivalry. The world breaks into very large blocks with very little coordination between them. And so each one of these is a vision for how the future could look like to take into account when people are doing projections it's not just the temperature change, but also what does that world look like when you have that temperature change? On the right is a different process that was led by IASA. It's called the World in 2050, looking at major drivers that will affect the ability of the world to achieve the SDGs. And you can see the six factors that we're focused on in this particular process. So we have tools in our toolbox to look at what the future could look like to ensure as we're planning what we're going to do about managing risk, we take into account not just the exposure, but also the vulnerability of the places that we're concerned about. And this is just an example from the shared socioeconomic pathways of SSP1, the world aiming to sustainable development, and SSP3, the world that breaks into large regional blocks. For each one of these, there is a several page narrative with a sentence about just about everything. And there's quantifications of GDP, population, Gini coefficient, a range of other factors that people can use in their analyses. So what does all this mean for health then? This is a slide from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. 
and in the center are some of the changes that are going on with a changing climate or that are leading to a changing climate. Around that are the exposures that are of particular interest for the health sector. And around that are the health outcomes we're concerned about. It's a very, very long list. And it is just about everything a ministry or Department of Health deals with, that this is an issue that cuts across the work that's being done in each and every country. It is a significant undertaking to increase the resilience to these kinds of challenges that we're going to be seeing. And I'll give just a couple of examples. Extreme weather and climate events in the upper left, NOAA's tracking billion dollar disasters. Let's hope this week will not be a billion dollar disaster. And the photo is something I took off the web from one of our recent flooding events in the US showing someone who had done a lot of work to protect their farm from that event. In the bottom are two photos from the Federated States of Micronesia in the Pacific just showing that these extreme weather and climate events are significantly affecting basically every country and trying to ensure that we protect and promote human health and well-being in the face of these events is a challenge that we have to increase our ambition to address. And, and there's a lot we can do. We can take opportunities when these events arise. This is from the British Virgin Islands after Hurricane Irma. There was an effort between PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, and UK Aid to look at a hospital that was damaged during the hurricane. And on the right is where the they developed plans for how to build this hospital back so it would not suffer those kinds of consequences and would continue to function even when there is another hurricane. Heat, another extreme event. On the left is a picture of random picture of somebody's garbage can in Tempe during one of the extreme temperature events that they've experienced over the last couple of years. And the right is a slide from 1995, a event in Chicago. This is the first heat wave that really captured the attention of researchers and of politicians, decision makers in the U.S. And the curve shows what you see in every heat wave. On the top is the heat index. The heat index goes up. Within 24 hours, people start to die. No one has to die in a heat wave. All those deaths basically could be preventable. That as temperatures go up, people's core body temperature goes up. And if actions are taken, then that can lead to heat stress, which can lead to heat stroke, which can lead to death because it's difficult to determine that heat actually caused the death, what you see are what we call excess deaths. You see more people than you would have expected during that period to die from cardiovascular disease, for example. And in the taste of Chicago, there was about 700 excess deaths, about 700 more people died than you would have expected during that time period. And that time period was when there was an event in Chicago called the Taste of Chicago. For any of you who are from Chicago, I'm sure you could describe it better than me. But it's basically a couple week festival down on Lake Michigan. Bands come in, they've got amusement park rides. There's quite a lot of activities that go on during this event. And they have a lot of food at these events, as you can imagine. And this is a photo someone took from behind the coroner's office. It's three of the nine refrigerated trucks the coroner's office commissioned from the people who brought in the food for the Taste of Chicago to hold all the bodies that the coroner's office couldn't hold. There was several heat waves in Europe in 2003 in which the estimate is there were 70,000 excess deaths. In 2010, there was a heat wave around Moscow, followed by a fire. The latest estimate is about 50,000 excess deaths. Heat waves in India and Pakistan last year, the year before, over 5,000 excess deaths. So the mortality in these events is very hard, and there's a lot of work going on to try and reduce that mortality because it doesn't have to happen. 
the people that one considers that are most at risk, people automatically think of adults over the age of 65, but also in the U.S. so far this year, there's been 40 infants, babies who have died in cars because it was hot outside. Parents didn't realize how quickly a car heats up and they died in the car. There's also impacts on productivity, which shows people working in orchards, roofers, people who work outdoors. As the temperature goes up, productivity can fall, and that's a significant economic impact that's of high concern. And there's other issues as well. I put this in because there's been a series of heat waves in Sweden this year. There's a heat wave in May where the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute estimated the return period was, you'd expect that kind of heat wave three times in one million years. Incredibly rare events. So this shows the heat led to uh, forest fires and something that was of high concern in the southern part of the country was because of the heat, it was also quite dry and uh, farmers didn't have enough water for their animals, so they allowed cows to go down to the nudist beaches. You can see the officials complained this was unhygienic and could pose a health risk, but it wasn't clear if it was unhygienic for the humans or for the cows. Vector-borne diseases is always a big topic of discussion. I will not go through the slide, but you see that temperature and precipitation affects a number of factors that influence the geographic range the seasonality and the intensity of transmission of dengue fever. Dengue is carried by a mosquito called Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus, both of which have quite an extensive range in the United States. And as temperatures go up, all else being equal, we'll likely see more dengue. This mosquito also carries Zika, chikungunya, yellow fever. There's concern about West Nile virus, particularly here in Seattle. Malaria, I could go on, but there's a long list of mosquito and vector borne diseases that will unlikely be affected by higher temperatures. This is an example of a projection for Canada for chikungunya carried by the, the same 80s mosquitoes, just showing a big shift in the range, potential range of, of chikungunya out towards the end of the century. That there really are no barriers between the US and Canada, the mosquitoes are just gonna keep moving north as the temperatures go up. And this has implications for health systems. What do you need to look for? What do you need to worry about? What, what do you train people for? I didn't put in, but there's been similar issues in Canada around Lyme disease, which has changed its range extensively in Canada. And there's been a campaign because most physicians were not trained to recognize Lyme disease because Lyme disease didn't used to exist in Canada. So there's been a big effort to make sure that they recognize these diseases as they move in so people can get diagnosis and treatment quite quickly. The likely biggest impact, health impact of a changing climate is going to be around food security and undernutrition. These data were published last night by the Food and Agriculture Organization there's been significant efforts to increase food security around the world. And this has been a good news story. There's been lots written about the significant advances that were made. You can see in 2005, there was just under 1 billion people who were food insecure. Unfortunately, since 2014, the number is stabilized and they're now going up. There's now more food insecure people than one would expect if we had continued that trajectory. And climate change is the reason that FAO is saying we're seeing this change in the curve. We worry about that because climate change could significantly reduce crop yields. On the left, it shows number of climate models under low and high emissions in 2030 and 2080, potentially very big increases in, sorry, very big reductions in crop yields, which will lead to increases on the right-hand side in the number of children who are chronically undernourished and therefore have stunting. So lots of concerns about how climate change is going to affect 
the ability to feed the world population. And it's not just one of these things at a time. It's everything altogether. And Byers published this quite recently. It's a hotspot analysis. And he looked at water, energy, and land. Embedded in this is a few issues around health. And so on the top, I put one of the figures he published on the water impacts at two degrees C under a scenario of the world just kind of muddling through. We continue to do what we do. Sometimes we move forward. For example, for many years, we move forward on food security. Sometimes we take a step backwards. And in the bottom, you see the global population exposed and vulnerable under one degree, one and a half degrees, two degrees, and three degrees. And just see the really big shift in the number of people who would be exposed and vulnerable, and therefore you might see significant impacts. So we need to think about health, not just alone, but you need to think about health together with all the other factors that are changing. And I'm just about done if that's what somebody was going to tell me. And that is, um, so we're talking about the future. It's, it's pretty hard to try and say exactly what's going to happen. There's lots of complexities. But that just encourages all of us to think more about how we take the range of possible futures into account, how we characterize the uncertainty, how we characterize what we know enough about to start taking action to make sure that we do protect and promote health even as our climate continues to change quite rapidly over the next couple of decades. Thank you, and I'm delighted to answer any questions. And do I give the screen back to you? Um, sure, we can do that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Yeah, why don't you. You can stop the share and then we'll just turn it on. People are welcome to turn on their videos and while we have our conversation session. So does anyone have any questions for Christy? Yes. <laughs> Great talk. I have plenty of questions, but I let other people go first. All right. I, I can stop the sharing, but it doesn't seem to do anything. Oh, there we go. There you go. We'll go to gallery view. So if you've got your video and you can turn it on, that'd be great. That way, um, Christy can see us as we're talking. She can see that she has an audience. So yeah, that was fantastic. Yeah, I'm not just talking to a screen that randomly works and randomly doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that was fantastic. Thank you for distilling uh, so many complex concepts into such an understandable format and across so many different perspectives and, and dimensions. So. Does anybody, I'll open it up for questions. I couldn't well, have been perfectly clear on everything. How about I go first and then people can think while I'm talking after all. <laughs> so first of all, and, and I, I'm not sure people know that, Christy doesn't just do her research from her desk. She travels to a lot of these places to see things right there. Um, so, so one question I had, that I've had ever since last year is you made a comment at some point, I think we were sitting in the bus next to each other at the workshop, and you made a comment that, that sometimes climate scientists deliver things in, in ways or they worry about certain accuracies the way you're thinking, this really isn't important for us, we need such and such. And do you have a wish list of what climate scientists should do differently in terms of how they deliver the data to you so that you can come up with better projections? That's a really good question, and I think what I was referring to is particularly around heat waves, that nearly all the investment into understanding heat waves and to seeing how we can establish effective heat wave early warning systems has focused on what's the threshold for when do we have a heat wave. It's not focused on how do we, how do we respond. There was a study a couple of years ago from Scott Sheridan at Kent State University, where he sent some students out that summer. Whenever there was a heat wave, he sent students out to various communities. Non-random sample, adults over the age of 65, and said, you know, let's ask them some questions. The answers were more than 90% of these adults over the age of 65, those who are most at risk, said they knew there was a heat wave. 75% named at least one thing people most at risk should do differently. 
and less than 50% did anything hmm. because they didn't see themselves at risk. I heard this discussion this morning about the East Coast and how people don't see themselves at risk and how to work together to communicate information. We need more understanding of what motivates appropriate behavior and how can we best motivate that behavior in the face of information. So sometimes just more information isn't enough. It's what gets people to do what it is that they should do. And that's a collaboration across climate scientists, social scientists, people who work in disaster risk management, people who work in health, and facilitating those collaborations so we can answer those questions and we can become much more effective, particularly around extreme events. It goes in the direction of science communication, right? I mean, we have these results, but what do they mean for people and how do they need to, to learn about what they mean and what, how, which actions to take, right? One of the one of the conversations I was in on this morning was talking with um, one of the social equity uh, managers for Houston. Believe it or not, we're having a we're having a presentation, a big event called Hot Science Cool Talks, and we will um, talk about the flooding and the impacts of Hurricane Harvey on Friday. Ironically, just as Florence is probably making landfall, we will be hosting an event to talk about how do you deal with these. Ex more extreme, um, extreme events. But one of the one of the comments that the um, this woman who's responsible for assuring that when uh, funding comes in and response uh, funding is is available, she's supposed to help make sure that the policies and procedures are in place so that the funds are distributed equitably and um, to greater impact. And one of the comments she made was, "It's." one of the best places they're finding to distribute funding is in terms of building stronger, more resilient uh, civil communities. So basically in increasing our civil discourse, basically, and our ability to connect with each other. And Scott, who was in Puerto Rico during um, the hurricanes last year, has talked about how community has just come alive and connected. So I wonder, do you see anything, Christy, that really emphasizes that that social infrastructure that responds mm -hmm. to yeah, There's a huge body of research on what's called social capital mm -hmm. and building that social capital in communities. It's been pretty interesting. I'm on some list in, in Seattle and King County in case mostly what people worry about here is, of course, an earthquake, um, in case of an earthquake. And in the survey I filled out, the information connected with the survey, the, the city and the county made it really clear that each individual is a first responder. Mm -hmm. That if we have a massive event, we have to take care of ourselves. That you can't expect someone to come in and take care of you. And that means taking care of your neighbors as well and making sure people know their neighbors, people connect with their neighbors. So there is quite a lot going on around building social capital, but again, that's underfunded, that it's much more interesting for funders to take a look at, oh, let's figure out a threshold for response. Let's figure out a threshold when you start seeing impacts and just it, kind of assuming somehow the responses are gonna happen, but the agencies funding the responses have other priorities or they don't have enough funding or a whole series of others, it doesn't happen to the same extent. So yes, we do need to figure out better how we build the social capital. We need to figure out what the lessons learned are. We need to figure out what's effective. So another example is the first heat wave early warning system in the US was in Philadelphia. It was built off of a program in the city for fear of crime. And basically each, each block has got someone designated for the program, for the fear of, of, of crime program. And that person has to understand their neighborhood. So the heat wave early warning system was built on top of that. So that's been replicated in other places, but all we know in other places is that heat wave early warning system save lives. We don't know which of all the different pieces of that warning system actually work in other places. Was it the billboards? Was it the neighbor? 
in your in your block that reaches out to people? Was it reaching out to the school children? We don't actually know how we can suggest to others to put in these systems in ways that are the most efficient and the most effective. Yeah. Sorry, I could go on all day, but we were working on a prevention of child <laughs> project and we uh, worked with a marketing company and they did brand segmentation and the branding segmentation actually gave us more information about how to target um, intervention dollars than any part of our informatics or our models. From <laughs> We've got a lot to learn. <laughs> Christy, uh, question. Um, so I unfortunately missed a little bit of the talk, but um, did you address much in the way of how I, I mean, I saw that you had some amount of agricultural impacts in, in towards the end, um, but they seem to be focused either on humans or other animals. Um, did you have any uh, ideas on plant growth. I'm currently in the midst of writing an NSF infuse on actually trying to breed plants to, uh, to put up with extreme weather events. So that's why I'm wondering. Oh, watch out, Krista. You'll be a personal communication reference in his program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think really the other 612 question. number over here, that's C. Yang, I think, right? Yes. Yeah, that's it's, that's She's a really a important question. Here at Minnesota. <laughs> and I didn't put in much about that because my focus is on health. Mm -hmm. Another area to look at is there is a series of recent publications, and I was part of one of them, looking at the consequences of rising CO2, not climate change, just rising CO2 on plant physiology. Right. And what happens to the C3 plants, so rice, wheat, and potatoes, with higher CO2, these are free air carbon dioxide exchange experiments, mm -hmm. big reductions in protein, in micronutrients, and we showed in B vitamins. Oh, that's just So great. our food is becoming much less nutritious, even though people think of CO2 as a plant food and for plant growth, that the plants, C3 plants particularly grow faster when you've got higher CO2, but they're not, they're less nutritious. Right, growth And is I think this is gonna be one of the biggest, nutrition. it's gonna be one of the biggest concerns we're gonna face is, and this affects absolutely everybody. The bread you buy down at the store doesn't have as much nutrition as it had a couple of decades ago. Mm -hmm. And it's only gonna get worse. So lots, lots needs to be done around how can we take a look at the challenges around agriculture food safety, food security. I feel like we're going to have to talk more at some point. <laughs> sure. It sounds great. I mean, that's the, thing with, that's the thing with Christy. She gave us a half hour snippet of what she's doing, but her depth is so deep in all of these different mm -hmm. areas that, yeah, it's a perfect person to pick, to pick her brain, right? <laughs> That'd be fine. Thank you. Climate, we should have Christy and Ime run a climate uh, session or stream at our workshop if we, if we can have space for it. Or maybe That'd be fun. Something, something to think about. That, that would be awesome. Patrick, I see you unmuted, right? You have a question? Yeah, I had a, I had a quick question. Um, I was thinking about uh, almost like threat complexes so there's all these different health effects or health consequences and um and i also missed just the beginning of the talk and so i was trying to i was wondering if there are interactions or critical interactions that maybe lead to sort of uh tipping points whether it be in a population or uh, more broadly in in a smaller kind of cluster of society that sort of thing um, and maybe have you studied anything like that where kind of the, the confluence of a whole bunch of different health impacts might lead to something that's almost like greater than the sum of the parts? It's, it's something we worry deeply about and we talk a lot about it. Health in this space is, saying it's underfunded is being super generous that NIH is the federal agency responsible for looking at health issues. 
there was a review by the Office of Management and Budget a few years ago, and the total health and climate change budget is less than 0.02% of the NIH budget. And it's falling that they funded about 14 projects six or seven years ago and have funded very few projects since. And it's not different in Europe and it's not different in Australia. It's changing in Canada with the new prime minister. And so part of the answer to your question is people really want to look at that and there's no money. Um, we don't have centers of excellence. We don't have, we don't have models where people put them together and then you run them and ask new questions. Every model is a one off, which is a real big problem. One of the reasons I showed you Ed Byers work is that because he is one of the first that is putting together multiple sectors. There's another project in Europe called ISIMIP that's also trying to put multiple sectors together. So yes, I, we all believe that that is true. We don't have evidence to support that. It's just based on a lot of experience that of course these things add together and that we do have to look at that. Um, so one example is when you look at projections of malaria, there's parts of Africa that'll become too hot and too dry for malaria. So skeptics like to say that's good news, right? Climate change means there'll be less malaria. If it's too hot and too dry for the mosquito that carries malaria, you're not gonna grow anything. So thinking about those kinds of intersections, we think about them, but there just hasn't been the funding to explore them, and it's really important. And just one quick follow-up. Um, are you working with the Climate Impacts Group at all? Is that still around? Yeah. Okay. It is still around, and they still, they, they do some things on health, but, you know, mostly they do the coastal work really very well. Okay. And I see there's a chat from Keith about the abstract I mentioned, but I don't know which abstract he meant. Oh, uh, he meant the, something that I had mentioned earlier. The, yeah, oh, so okay. Break, Never mind. Late break. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I already got okay. that tone, so. so. Okay, good. I don't have to. So I don't want to stop. Always it's not me. I'm good. Asking more substantive questions. Is I have I have general questions for Christy just to make sure we don't lose track of her and can can maybe engage with her in the future. So um, anybody have any other you know questions for Christy that are substantive? And I'm sure we have lots of questions. <laughs> um, We're holding ourselves back. You, you've revealed to us, you've revealed that you um, go to AMS uh, conferences, so we know we can probably find, I do. we can probably connect with you there, which would be terrific to try and make sure we can. And, and I'll be at AGU this year because I was the health lead for the National Climate Assessment Number 4 mm -hmm. on the Human Health Chapter. So there'll be presentations. I think I gave a presentation, John Balbus gives the poster at AGU on that. So I will be around AGU. We'll find out which days when they finally post the agenda. What we have traditionally done is um, our group meets, we have our sessions, and when the sessions have finished, we all go together for a milkshake. That's nice. I, <laughs> Cy Rebella from MIT kicked that off. Um, so we try to go to a greasy burger joint uh, and get a shake. This year, since it's in D.C., I, I haven't scouted out where the milkshakes are <laughs> in the area, but we will make sure that you are on our distribution list so that you can see where we're going. <laughs> that would be great. I'd enjoy that. That'd be fun. Awesome. That's terrific. Um, as we were talking and, and as Patrick's question was kind of rolling around um, in our Planet Texas program, which is the statewide cross-disciplinary project that's just been funded here in, at UT. Um, named after a Kenny Rogers song. I know, named after a Kenny Rogers. <laughs> it's such a great effort, but I don't know where Kenny Rogers came into it, but we have a classicist who's on our team. He's a classicist and he is looking at um, past resilient societies and what are the patterns and trends that you can see. And so I wonder, and I don't know, um, Patrick, you may know, you may have heard something about this or maybe Christy you have, but just wonder if in that literature base, if those researchers may have found some of those cross combinations of a society was fine until these two or three factors all kind of added up and resulted in collapse moment for them or a failure failure moment um, that 
is a question I will follow up and ask him because I would be interested to see what he says. And something interesting. There is, the anthropologists are working on this. Mm -hmm. And so there are, there's groups at, there's a group at Washington State University that's been focusing on the Southwest of the US for quite some time. And Brian Fagan, Brian Fagan was San Diego maybe? He published a bunch of books, you find the books on Amazon looking at various societies and why they failed. Mm -hmm. You can learn lessons from that. The challenge is the rate of climate change now is so fast. We've talked about moving from pre-industrial, an increase in global mean surface temperature above pre-industrial, one degree since 1860. Most of it's been since 1950. And we're talking in another decade to go a half degree more. It's just appallingly fast. And so, yes, there's lessons learned, but the rate of change is so rapid that it's hard to take those lessons because these these other ones were long-term drought. The Peck, Jonathan Overpeck really worries about mega drought in the Southwest. And are we heading into a several hundred year drought, for example? We're looking at situations where human societies either were not there or was so long ago, it was, it's hard to understand how those lessons could apply today because we're in a world where we're all connected, where we've got people like Jonathan Overpeck telling us about drought in the Southwest. Obviously, the communities that live there didn't have that opportunity. So there's lots of differences. There's also lessons that can be learned, and people I know are working on that. I don't know a lot about it other than what I said. So it's thinking both about how you take those lessons, but then in a very, very, very different context. And can we think about with our different contexts where we have to start making interventions faster, like early warning and response systems, so mm -hmm. that people know what they need to do as these extreme events keep coming at us. Another person that's done some work in that area, um, kind of looking at more kind of contemporary uh, combinations, maybe more generally, is uh, Thomas Homer Dixon. And um, he has books that he's written in the past, but then there were a few papers recently, one on something I think it was called synchronous failure. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was sort of the, the phrase that it was kind of this uh, merging of different things happening to create kind of a new systemic collapse or failure. Um, nice. Well, um, I'm going to need to sign off. I'm not sure uh, we could we can keep going. Thank you for being so generous with your time, Christy, and thank you for presenting. Sure, it's been a really nice conversation where we can be a little more reflective about what we're trying to do with our models and our data. Yeah, <laughs> why it all matters. <laughs> so I would suggest that in addition to the milkshake. Um, maybe whoever has specific questions to Christy and wants to network, maybe you can email her and set up a meeting at AGU if, if Christy would be willing to meet with a few of us. I could see, for sure. example, example, Pat and Christy having lots to talk about. Pat, I mean, he does a lot of sustainability research and among other things, he does um, sci-fi prototyping to communicate future scenarios for example, for climate change. And so far, probably not focusing on health, but I guess that could change. So. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Maybe. to talk more. <laughs> all right, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank all of you, I really appreciate it. All thank right, you. I'm gonna stop the recording now, bye-bye. Thank you, bye everybody.